Wilson School at Princeton University. We're coming to you from Princeton's campus to talk about the recent Ebola crisis and to really look at the issue of sustainability versus emergency preparedness. Uh, joining us to look at this important issue today are Kim Bonner, who's a Princeton alumna who worked on the ground in Sierra Leone on this um, crisis, and Carolyn Rouse, who's a professor of anthropology at Princeton's, in Princeton University, um, who's done a lot of work and research on West Africa and has actually built a high school um, in West Africa, in Ghana, um, that has been around for five years. And so they are both uh, fully prepared to address this important issue. Um, I will say this is a preview to a longer conversation that we will have uh, in the fall in Dublin, Ireland. We will have a forum there on November 2nd and 3rd on uh, global health crises, looking at the Ebola epidemic as a case study of a global health crisis. And so if you'd like to hear more, we uh, encourage you to join us in Dublin and we will give the information about how to register for that conference on the YouTube link um, where this Google on air will be posted after our conversation. So starting us off today, Carolyn, uh, I pass it to you. Okay, well um, I wanted to ask Kim a number of questions about her experiences um, studying the Ebola crisis and global health in West Africa. And um, I, as somebody who's been very interested in development and the questions of sustainability, I'm particularly interested in the responses with respect to, are these responses going to have long-term implications for the communities or were they short-term? Are they going to come and then go? Because if we look at the number of Ebola crisis in the region, West Africa down to the Congo, you see that there are actually a lot more outbreaks that occur every two, three years. They were small before, but one could argue that perhaps Ebola is endemic to the region. And so I'm really interested in whether or not um, some organizations are actually prepared to, to make sustainable changes to the healthcare system such that they can handle um, Ebola crisis and other healthcare crisis now and into the future. So I wanted to ask Kim if she could talk about um, two approaches that I've noted, which is one is um, an approach where you go in and you bring all of the equipment with you, you bring all of the healthcare workers with you, and you come in, you treat the emergency. And the other one is to work with the existing uh, community health clinics, decentralize the operation rather than centralize the operation. And I wanted Kim to sort of talk us through the effectiveness of these two different responses and how it worked with the Ebola crisis, what were the pluses and minuses with respect to either. So could you help us with that, Kim? Sure, Carolyn. Thanks very much for your question. I think when we consider uh, a response to something like Ebola, there's both the emergency response and then there's the longer term reconstruction. And these two components have a different set of actors who, who are involved, and some do span both, but it's important to consider the different mandates uh, that these international organizations or non-governmental organizations or even community-based organizations might have, as well as their comparative strengths and experiences. So as you rightly noted, there are some organizations that uh, have a mandate for emergency response, have experience in that, and have uh, the resources and capacity to, to move quickly and establish things that are quite specialized, like Ebola treatment centers. And in that, um, even, even with that experience, uh, an outbreak the size of this one really uh, is one that has forced a number of organizations to really greatly expand their, their capacity and their knowledge base across, uh, across their personnel and how to respond. Uh, there are other organizations that have been in the three most heavily affected countries for a number of years. Uh, they have strong community links and um, were there before the Ebola crisis and will continue to be there afterwards. And a lot of their comparative advantage lies in working very closely with communities in helping to build, sustain, regain trust, uh, and to make sure that essential services are provided. A lot of the secondary effects of Ebola, um, so 
when health systems are are struggling because of the Ebola outbreak, there there then becomes a number of diseases that that can scale up, such as malaria, such as measles. Uh, these other organizations are quite well placed to to provide that additional secondary support. Uh, of course, there's international, other international organizations that have a technical or coordinating role. So while their on-the-ground implementation may be different, um, the role that they're, the role that they hold is really pulling together all of the actors to make sure there's a coordinated response. And all this is happening in conjunction with the national governments themselves. Okay, thank you for that, Kim. So I was also interested in, okay, get, getting back to this kind of centralization versus decentralization. You know, there are some benefits to having a centralized, coordinated healthcare center with the best equipment and some of the best doctors. Um, and I think in the literature, uh, it was noted that, in fact, the number of days it took to be, for people to get to some of these centralized center centers were almost equivalent to getting to some of the local centers, which means that there may not have been a stigma against going, as many people thought. But there's also some benefits to having a local hospital where you know the people in the hospital um, and maybe you want to be near your family. D did you see any cultural response differences to the centralized versus the decentralized? And um, you know, how did people? Were there any kinds of surveys from the people who had been treated there in terms of how they felt about either um, kind of treatment facility, mm -hmm. Ebola treatment facility? No, that's that's a great question. And I think when we're looking at a, a disease like Ebola, the first thing to consider is prevention. So what are ways that we can prevent the, um, this outbreak from spreading? So I think the first component to consider is how, how do we get information to people? Uh, how do we make sure that people are getting credible information, that this is not spreading fear, but instead helping people to see what can be done um, for either their sick family members or how they themselves can avoid getting Ebola. And a lot of community-based organizations have a real strength in that area because they already have the local connections, the local trust. And it's incredibly important uh, with a disease that can look incredibly scary to people with a very high mortality rate and with a very unfamiliar uh, methodology for, for treatment. So that, that is one incredibly important first step. In terms of the actual treatment facilities, there, there are different models, and part of that also depends on the timing and the location of the outbreak. So when we're talking about uh, the peak of the Ebola outbreak, uh, the largest uh, Ebola treatment center in the world had been built with over 250 beds. And even at that capacity, there was not sufficient bed space for all of the people who needed, um, who needed a bed. So important to consider that at a specific time and place, this was a necessary intervention. In other areas that are perhaps either more rural or areas where there might be um, less trust, it's it, other models like community, community care centers or smaller either Ebola treatment centers or units that allow people who suspect that they have Ebola to attend uh, have also been piloted. And the benefit of this is it allows people to uh, an easier access to where they need to go. Um, the drawback for it um, can be uh, in, in assuring, um, <laughs> you're right there, in ensuring um, infection prevention and control and making sure that uh, the very, very high standards of, of keeping staff safe and keeping uh, Ebola-suspected people safe from each other uh, from infection uh, is, is challenging and also critical to maintain. Uh, so those would be some of the trade-offs there. So, you know, global health has learned a lot of lessons in the past 20 years um, with respect to HIV interventions and a number of other interventions, guinea worm. And I ask myself, is, has Ebola taught us anything or is it such a different kind of disease and different kinds of, um, you know, um, kinds of transmission issues? that we don't really learn anything from this or are we what what are the lessons that we can learn from 
in some ways a very successful intervention, although a little late. But are there any things that you think we can learn, take away from this? Um, sure. I, I think that this Ebola outbreak really does offer an opportunity uh, to, to reconsider the ways that we, we catch an outbreak and the ways that we can respond to an outbreak. And what this boils down to is some of the long-term aspects that you've already addressed. So this would be how do we strengthen health systems? How much of, it, of this is a priority um, for, for governments and for the international community? Um, in 2005, uh, member states uh, of the World Health Organization agreed to the international health uh, regulations. And this is a set of policies that focus on reporting outbreaks. And this sort of mechanism is meant to be in place to, to prevent things like uh, what we've seen with this Ebola outbreak. And I think the, the scale of this allows us to really consider what what's what can be improved in in our implementation of these international health regulations as there's already been a global consensus of the importance of these and then more broadly than surveillance because that's largely the focus there is how do we strengthen health systems particularly in poorer countries so that they can quickly respond uh, to to outbreaks I think that um, the comparative advantage that some of the countries surrounding these three countries had was additional time to prepare a response and a very rapid response once, um, once cases were detected. It's interesting that you say this, Kim, because um, I think that um, also in the past 20 years there's been a model of intervention that has really supported the kinds of NGO work and NGOs that are not affiliated necessarily with the state um, and really funding them because we feel like they're innovative um, or they're free from a corrupt government but it seems like with contract tracing or surveillance of health health clinics and people that in fact states need to be intimately involved in helping to build these health systems. So d does this crisis say something about the need to maybe shift some of the focus from supporting NGOs to supporting states? I would definitely agree with you on the importance of states in in any sort of health system strengthening exercise in any sort of disease response. Uh, it's it's a critical role and it, uh, it is the responsibility of the state. Um, there are areas where there's uh, a lot of NGO support for these activities and it can be quite long-standing. And I agree with you, uh, how finances are moved really can determine some of the relative strengths of uh, either government or NGO response. I think who who can give that funding and where they where they choose to give it really depends on the constraints of the donors themselves. And so it is worth considering what are the constraints under which they operate? Are those constraints valid? And are there are there optimizations that we could see, uh, particularly in light of what we've seen from this Ebola uh, response? Uh, great question. Yeah. So. Um, uh, I was also thinking that maybe you want to tell people what these health international health regulations are um, so that they have a sense of what it is that they're trying to get states to do. Um, so what are they specifically? Sure, would be happy to. Um, so the international health regulations grow out of regulations that have been developed uh, in 1969 reporting on just a few diseases. and. In, in an era where we have uh, increasing amounts of emergent, uh, emergent diseases, it's very, very important to have surveillance systems in place that allow for a fast response um, when we consider pandemic, uh, pandemic diseases. The quicker a country or a non-state um, non actor can sound the warning 
of a potential outbreak, then the faster the country themselves or the international community can support a response there. So largely uh, the goal of these international health regulations is to contain outbreaks. Uh, we know that there will be disease outbreaks, but information uh, and first of all information and second of all rapid response are two of the key elements that would allow us to, to flatten that uh, epidemiological curve as quickly as possible. And who are some of the main actors now in the region doing the work to kind of continue to establishing these systems, these health systems? I think that would be largely government. Uh, there, Of course, there are many uh, non-governmental organizations who've been in these areas uh, for a long time. There are um, other national governments that are providing technical or operational support in how to strengthen particularly disease, disease surveillance. Uh, we've also seen other country governments sending technical teams to provide support for contact tracing. So it is a combination of uh, both the national government as well as international organizations providing funding and technical support as well as other countries uh, also providing funding and technical support as well as NGOs that are providing some of the implementation support on the ground. So in terms of um, if you were to be advising some of these groups, the international and the local groups, what are some of the things that you think need to be studied to understand, to make these systems better? Um, you know, do you need to be studying culture? Do you need to be studying, um, um, do you need to be evaluating agendas, health agendas, um, preventative disease versus chronic diseases? I mean, what are some of the questions you'd be asking um, both the local governments but also the UN or the uh, World Health Organization or all of these different organizations or what do you think are the things that they should be focusing on in terms of coordination? Do you have anything like since you're a researcher what would you say needs to be sort of looked at? I think that's a great question and I think that's what we see happening right now in in rebuilding efforts we see uh, really great, uh, a great endeavor right now to convene many partners to understand what are the priorities across stakeholders. So not only residents of many of these communities that have been affected, but also some of the partners who have been uh, long standing in these regions. Um, particularly with secondary effects of Ebola, uh, that is that is one really critical element. Also looking at sustained infection prevention and control in some of these primary health centers. So how can we protect uh, staff and patients when uh, a potential, uh, an Ebola suspected person might be coming to that clinic? So I think those are some key areas to focus on. Um, I think this conversation is continuing to emerge and continuing to move, so it'll be interesting to see how that develops, but those would be two that, that I, I see the focus has already started to, to build on. Interesting. Um, and so, uh, Elizabeth, did you have anything that uh, you wanted to share with respect to your work with um, um, the international community donors? No, I, th I think... Um, Kim, I think, addressed it a little bit, but I think one of the tensions, it seems, is that um, when people are looking at where their dollars are going and where donations are going, there is this tension, it seems to be, whether the foundations are going to pivot to supporting state actors more than they support NGOs and whatnot. And I just wondered if Kim could address some of those tensions and if she's seeing the same sort of thing and discourse in the philanthropy world about where they're putting their dollars. Okay. I think that it's it's important to note that there's many ways that support uh, can be given. And so there, there are some actors that are independently financed. Um, so that could either be uh, NGOs or also foundations that have their own sources of funding and can implement or can fund others as needed. Um, 
some of the funding agencies may provide support either directly to the government uh, or they may be constrained in that and may be providing that to international NG NGOs. It really depends on their capacity uh, there. But there's also options in providing technical support or even human resource support. So one might find um, officers from a certain either NGO or foundation that are able to actually be embedded within or working alongside of government to provide some additional support. So it's not just money, there's also really that brain power uh, that, that really can be leveraged here. Well, I think we've hit our 20 minutes. Um, I'll ask our two guests if they have anything else they'd like to add before we sign off. No, thank you. No? Well, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Kim. This was terrific. And as I said at the outset, we will be hosting this forum in Dublin, Ireland on November 2nd and 3rd. We hope to do more of these Google Hangouts on air. Um, so we will post on the link on YouTube um, the information about both the conference but also about other materials that we've produced on this important topic. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.